Another common false god that these people worship is the pursuit of personal pleasure. And this is random. Uh, people will do anything they want to that brings them pleasure. Drinking, socially, partying, drugs falls into this category in my mind. Uh, nicotine, smoking, caffeine, drinking, uppers, uh, downers, if it feels good, do it. The whole hedonistic mentality, the uh, vegging out on the sofa and watching CSI or Judge Judy. Sorry about that. A bit poking yourself there. I mean, that's, you know, the pursuit of personal pleasure can easily become a God to us. It can be first place in our life. Anything that feels good to us, we do it. I know that's the way I was before my recommitment to Christ at age 20. I was a college student. I was in a fraternity, man. If I wanted to go shoot basketball and blow off pints, I did it. Partying, drinking in my fraternity. We stayed up all night shooting pool. You name it. It was, it was a pleasure-seeking lifestyle. And that was me before my recommitment to Christ. And, and I think that's true for many people. Well, many times our temptation is not to abandon our worship of God wholesale and turn wholesale to another false God. <clears throat> but many times our temptation is to just continually, periodically let other things be more important to us than our relationship with God. This week it may be, or this month or this spring, it may be the pursuit of pleasure, this fall it might be the false god of financial prosperity. You, uh, to, you can typify this by the description that um, the Bible gives us of a carnal person um, is that they have, they worship themselves as first priority. In other words, um, something is going to be on the throne of your life. And for many people it is ourself. We are on the throne of our life. And that kind of typifies the cycle of uh, first one thing and then another being the first place in our life. It's when yourself is on the throne of your life. Basically, your number one priority is to look out for number one. Your number one priority is to do what feels right to you. If you want to carry a grudge against your brother or sister-in-law because of something, you have that right. If it feels good, you do it because you going to look out for number one. If you feel the temptation to be judgmental against another person, you're going to do it. Uh, if we, yeah, if we wanted to take the Deion Sanders mentality, I'm going to get mine. Y'all ever heard that? I'm going to get mine. You know, like there's a, a lot of amount of goods and material possessions in this life to accrue and I'm going to get mine. That whole self-seeking, looking out for number one attitude is a good way to think about this false God and ourself being the number one person in our life. So back to our passage a minute. What did Jesus do in the face of this temptation from Satan to worship him? Satan, I mean, Jesus once again quoted scripture where we are expressly commanded to worship God and serve him only. I want to take you to the passage that Jesus quotes because it, it's a great passage and I think there are, there are a couple of things I want us to see there. Flip back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and I'm going to point to a couple of verses there. Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is the passage that Jesus quotes Satan from. And we're going to get to this quote that Jesus makes. But first, I want, I want to give you the context and then I want to point out verse the promise. This, as we talked about lately, is um, Moses' final words to the nation of Israel right before they entered the promised land and took over the promised land. And so these are Moses' last words to the people. And in verse 3, he gives them the promise from God. And he tells them, okay, he says, Hear, O Israel, be careful to do these commandments I give you, that it may go well with you. And that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. In other words, God says, do these things I've commanded you so that it may go well with you. And you may be fruitful and multiply and fill the land and be 
prosperous and enjoy this land flowing with milk and honey. That's a, that's a promise from God. And then down at the end of this passage, he gives them a, some punishment. And he says down in verse, um, oh, and, and the warning is they're going into this promised land. Well, there's already these foreign nations that live there. And these foreign peoples all have foreign gods. And, and God does not want his people to be ensnared by these false gods. And so he says, you shall not go, oh, in verse 14 of chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. Now Moses says, you shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. And so that's the, that's the punishment. But the directive that he has given the people was backed up in um, verse 13. I'm going to read verse 12 too. This is what Jesus is quoting. He said, then take care, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve. And by His name you shall swear. That's what, um, that's the directive that Jesus is quoting here. Well, Jesus won His battle against Satan. And how do we know this? Because in our passage, Jesus said in verse 10, Matthew chapter 4, verse 10, that Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, so forth. And then verse 11, Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. And the point is that you and I too can rebuke Satan in just this way. When we recognize the temptations of Satan in our life, we have the power of God that Jesus had to do the exact same thing that Jesus did here, to recognize our temptations and say, Be gone, Satan. I rebuke you. By the power of God, I do, I do not have to succumb to your temptations. And you and I have that power. And we talked about it um, two weeks ago, I know, and this is something that I need to tell myself all the time, but you and I can have every confidence in the world that we can be victorious in our temptations. We don't have to cave. And many times we can remain uh, or emerge victorious. We're going to talk about that again in just a second. So we too can rebuke Satan and through the power of God defeat him in this way. In the book of James it says, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And that, that's strong. So we learned that from our passage. Um, I don't know if I told y'all I've been reading this series of war books. Man, it's, a, it's totally a guy thing. Uh, main character in these series of books, his name is Earl Swagger. Uh, man, he, he's a hero, top of all. Um, well, in this one book, I read Tell Horse Coming. He wound up on the wrong end of some real bad folks. He gets stuck in his prison camp. And, I mean, the worst of the worst on the whole planet seem to be in this prison camp. And he is that big dumb man. Midway through the book, his life is almost over. They chain him to this uh, concrete block they've made, and they put it in a wheelbarrow, and they roll the wheelbarrow out on this barge, and they take him out on this river in the Louisiana swamp. And he knows he's about to die. They push the wheelbarrow to the edge of the boat, tip it up, the concrete block hits the water, and pretty soon, you know, he follows. And uh, <laughs> pretty soon. He followed him right down and plunged him down into the river and he gets down there and he's just a matter of minutes before he's going to die. He looks around through the murky water and he sees other concrete blocks that have skeletons chained to it. He realizes he ain't the first one that's been done in this way. Well, um, he miraculously escaped. I'll spare you all the details, but a uh, fantastic book, Pale Horse Coming. But the point, the point I'm making is that's a terrible way to die. It's terrible. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 18 verses 6 and 7? Jesus said, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned 
down the debt of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptations come. Temptations are going to come. Resist them. And don't ever be the source of temptation to someone else. You've got to serve somebody. Worship the only true God. That is this third temptation that um, I feel like Jesus faced here. And, and if you look on the back of your bulletin, I try to summarize the most important lessons for us out of these three temptations of Jesus. I know this is a little wordy for my attempt. You can take this home and look at it for yourself. These are things we've all talked about in the last three weeks, and I'm just, just going to hit the highlights of them. These are things that I think you should know that we learned from this passage about the temptations of Jesus. Number one is this. Satan is not a fairy tale figure. I, mean, I don't think he has horns, and I don't think he breathes fire. But me and you should know that Satan is real. He is a viable force of evil in this world that you and I live in. And he is bent on mind and your destruction. There's nothing he would like better than to see you destroyed by your circumstances, by your failures, by your successes, by others. You should know that Satan is real and he is not on your side. The second thing, I think this is so good, is that Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness where he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And it was a very difficult, challenging circumstance. But he was led by the Holy Spirit out there. And the book of Luke said Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and he was led out there. And one point about this for you and I is that we can be right in the middle of God's will for our lives. We can be right where we need to be with God and still find ourselves right smack dab in the middle of the wilderness, uh, in the middle of a difficult and challenging circumstance. God knows that. And that's right where He wants us. It may, we may be out there for Him to test us so, so we will see areas of weakness in our life. Um, it, we may be out there for God to teach us something that He wants us to learn. Uh, and so Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit. Oh, and, and God knew exactly, God led him out there. He knew exactly what he was going through. He knew exactly what he needed. And God was going to give Jesus exactly what he needed. And the point for you and I is that the same that God knows exactly what's happening with us, and God will take care of us. Um, yeah, God will totally take care of us. And then I, I mentioned what I said just a minute ago. We can have every confidence in the world that in any given situation of testing and temptation, through the power of God, you and I can emerge victorious. We can resist our temptation. We can withstand the testing. We can emerge on the other side having pleased God with, um, by doing the right thing. And that, and that we have every reason to expect that we need not fail.